So I have the honor of introducing our um, surgery day lecturer for this session. And the truth of it is, it's such an easy job because we all know Ike and love Ike. Ahmed, who is um, going to treat us today to his MIGS 2.0. Um, if there's anybody who's been an innovator in the space that we all are so excited about to see more um, innovation from, it, it would be Ike Ahmed. And so, Ike, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Cindy. It is really an honor to be here. Um, as many of you do know, I've, have, I've had a little bit of a checkered past uh, with the AGS, just to be frank and to be honest with you. Um, it was a couple years ago where it basically was essentially banned from membership. Some of you may know that. I'm kind of half joking about that. Um, but I, have, I am a member now, and I'm proud to show my membership uh, card here. Although I think the, I think this, the little ribbon's a bit corny, so I'll put that on the side. But uh, yeah, just as an aside, you know, I, was, uh, I always wondered why we have a provisional, sorry to be political here, a, pr a provisional and a general membership. I thought we should all be equal. We're all in glaucoma. Why not have one happy group? But nevertheless, I'm happy to be here. AGS is really the big show. I've been, uh, I had the pleasure to speak at many different venues, but this is really truly, despite you know, some issues that maybe I've had with AGS, this is really the big show. This is where the greatest minds in glaucoma come to, con you know, to discuss, to debate, to argue. So to speak uh, on MIGS is very exciting for me. Again, it's a little bit different. I'm probably not very traditional. Uh, rather than classical music, usually you hear me playing Public Enemy or Fight the Power in my OR, so it's a little different. Uh, but I do thank very much, really, and I am deeply honored uh, from David Greenfield's invitation, Kuldev Singh, Cindy's introduction, and I have to give props out to my fellowship mentors. Uh, Alan Crandall, Jane Dirk, and Norm Zabriskie, I owe them a tremendous amount of gratitude for helping me along the way. Now, let's get started here. These are my disclosures. I'll probably spend a few more than five seconds for this slide. But I want to just show again all the things that are happening in glaucoma. And although conflict of interest is a real concern, industry bias and other issues are a real concern, none of us want to be talking heads. However, the collaboration, of course, is key to progress, and we've seen this in all types of interventions in glaucoma and otherwise. What's happening in this space here? Well, look, we have four mixed companies. We have about $400 million raised to study glaucoma surgery in a MIGS type of way. There are over 6,000 patients that have been enrolled or are enrolled in randomized controlled trials with MIGS devices. That's a lot of evidence that we're going to glean from these patients. Over 70,000 implants have been placed worldwide already. Majority OUS, and I won't get too political there, but you can see what's happening in this space here. Some of the microscope data in the U.S. data here shows an increasing utilization of MIGS devices. A steady reduction in trabeculectomies is some increase in tube shunts, but the trend certainly shows that MIG certainly is here and increasing. But there are real questions. Is this an illusion? Is this for real disease? Is this for, are these just for cataract surgeons? Is it, for, is it light therapy? What are the questions? And they're all good questions to ask. And I hope to kind of share some of my perspectives with you here today. There are more publications now in peer review, over 70 publications at last count. You can add five more this year in 2015. So we're seeing at least, and these are excluding case reports and reviews. These are original series and patients. So I leave them my talk MIGS 2.0 because I can tell you we've already passed the first stage of MIGS. Unfortunately, those of you in the U.S. have not necessarily been able to taste a lot of MIGS, but I'm going to share with you why I think we're already at MIGS 2.0, and I hope that we're only starting. I hope that we'll come back and talk about 3.0, 4.0, and 5.0. So don't write off MIGS because I hear folks talking about, is this for real? This kind of put things in perspective for me. The only people who like traps and tubes are glaucoma specialists. <laughs> Think about it. The refractive patients don't say that. Our phaco patients don't say that. Even our vitreoretinal patients often don't say that. But it's sort of true, and this is not a diss on tradition. Maybe it is sort of, but it's not a diss on those who practice tradition, I should say. What does surgical innovation mean to you? It may mean different things. Is it simply a TRAB replacement? Is it an alternative medication or conventional therapy? Is it something we do with cataract surgery? Is it a blood procedure? These are all questions. They mean different things. So as you dream ahead, and I encourage all of you, especially the young folks in the room, I met a couple of medical students at the posters today, I want you to, I want you to, to dream and not be held down by dogma. Question the norm. Question me, after all, uh, what's out there. 
Of course, we know our conventional therapies. We have medications with their very known issues. I won't go into that, of course, as well. We often skim over it, but they are true. And of course, at the other extreme of the gap here, we have our traditional surgery, which of course work quite well in terms of IOP lowering, but we really typically reserve them to later on in treatment. So this is kind of what I like to kind of talk about interventional glaucoma. MIGS fits a, fits a potential space that can be pretty wide in this gap area, in this chiasm that exists for our patients. This is not the same, but this can be think about, thought about in different areas of medicine. I put this up uh, for my Johns Hopkins colleagues. This is the Interventional Radiology website. Better, faster, safer. MIGS is not better, faster, safer yet, but that's of course what we want to try to achieve. And I think we really want to look at this disease as an interventional way. Glaucoma is not necessarily a surgical disease, but I do believe high pressure at this point in time is a surgical disease at least potentially better managed. This requires a change in how we view surgery. We intervene earlier, reduce morbidity of progression. But to do this, we have to have safety. Safety is the predicate to proceed early. We hopefully then will reduce the need to go to more aggressive therapies using a stepwise approach from less aggressive, less risky to more aggressive, more risky options here. But there's no question this is conjecture until we have the right data and cost effectiveness studies that are well, well needed here. And there are many who say, or at least will feel, it sounds great, but you know what, we're not changing. And that's completely fine, and that's completely reasonable. We have real patients that are going blind, and we have to proceed with what we're comfortable with. But I will say that stagnation is not an option in medicine and progress. How do we define MIGS? Well, we've kind of gone over, I'm not gonna go through this in detail. Ab internal, minimally traumatic, ultimately safe. Invasiveness is, or, or in, 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 you know, minimally uh, invasive techniques are not necessarily on incision size after all. It's based on how much we're manipulating tissue, how much we're affecting the physiology and anatomy of the eye. So it's more than just incision size. Many people debate what is MIGS and what isn't. Back 2009, I, I presented the concept of MIGS at AGS. I think I had a lot of laughs and, and uh, question marks, which is completely reasonable. Now everybody wants to be MIGS, and that's okay as well. But you know, there are some differences here, and I'm not gonna debate. It doesn't mean the other procedures are not good. After all, they do have their roles, absolutely have a role for that. But I think I like to kind of keep MIGS in the category of ab internal, at least at this point in time. Again, who am I to say what MIGS isn't? This is sort of my approach. Of course, outcome is not just lowering pressure, it's about reducing medications. And that's something we'll talk about. Of course, we know the benefit to our patients of a surgically controlled pressure versus medically controlled pressure certainly as far as the patient's attitude and approach to their eye. Look at the difference between these eyes here. We typically talk about MIGS being for more of the milder diseases, for, for modest pressure targets. But I'll tell you, things are moving up toward TRAVS. So TRAVS, watch out, and I'll share some data here today as well on this issue here. We can think about it like cardiovascular medicine, perhaps, where we have medications in cabbage, very different extremes, different type of patient indications. Stents have a role, they don't do everything and they have certain, certain places that they may be beneficial for. MIGS perhaps has some of these roles. And MIGS as a space, of course, is, is quite a diverse space actually as well. Of course, we know that as, as cataract surgeons that FACO, of course, lowers pressure. This is well established. The opportunity to synergize with MIGS, of course, is certainly an advantage. And we know that many of our patients present to us with glaucoma and cataract. It's an opportunity to proceed. And I, I, I will very much go after cataract plus a mixed procedure if I can before proceeding to more aggressive procedure if that patient is indicated as such. And again, data is well established here. I think some of the best work here from the O study, Steve Mansberger's publication on looking at IOP lowering. It's the modest lowering of IOP. The safety is well established, of course. I'd like to talk about MIGS in three different categories here. Shems canal, suprachoidal space, and subconjunctival space stenting aqueous into these three spaces here. And we have a wide variety of devices of which you can see many are not currently approved and investigational here, that all can basically drain aqueous at different spaces here. Now MIGS is evolving, and all good things must evolve, just like my iPhones, from iPhone 1 to iPhone 5. I just got, I just got a crack on my iPhone here uh, just a couple days ago. They all must evolve, so MIGS must evolve as well. And just as we've seen options, MIGS and MIGS Plus, by the way, before iPhone came out with their, with their 6 Plus, I had already thought about Mix Plus, I already had talked about Mix Plus, so I gotta call um, the folks over at, at Apple about this term. But I'll tell you what I mean by Mix and Mix Plus a little bit there. Now the thing with MIGS is, Mix came about because we need a safer procedure. Safety has not been the main issue with Mix. After all, with trabeculectomy, we know the great effectiveness. We're trying to get away from the safety issues from traps. 
but rightfully so effectiveness has been questioned. And I, of course, you know, we've heard the term MEGS, minimally effective glaucoma surgery, which, which I take that with greatest of respect and a great challenge to push further. But I will tell you, I think the pendulum is swinging over to efficacy. And that's why I labeled this talk MIX 2.0. It's all about efficacy now. It's about strategically planning and targeting stenting. It's about broadening the purpose of stenting beyond bypassing to scaffolding. It's about using visco expansion in supracoidal space to answer problems and issues that we deal with our tough patients in the supracoidal space. And it's about augmenting with the well-known mitomycin C with microstents in the subcon space. We all are familiar with the eye stent approved here, smallest device, ultimately very, very safe to use. But the single stent data combined with FACO versus FACO alone was certainly not impressive to us as glaucoma specialists. No question, hands down. The safety, of course, was there, which is great, but we were lacking certainly in efficacy. And there's certainly good basic data talking about multiple bypasses are likely to reduce the resistance to a greater degree than the single bypass. So let's go to multiple placements, let's target them. In vitro data seems to support this. Of course, our approach is typically using a gonioscopic approach, tilting the microscope, tilting the patient's head. Those of you that have used this procedure know, despite what marketing may say, this is not a simple procedure. This is actually a highly technical procedure to do it right, to place the device adequately within the canal. It is very difficult, I'll tell you right now. I don't want to scare people, but to do it perfectly well, I look at my old videos from seven years ago, and there's no question how I've improved with my, with my learning of this procedure. So it's something that really takes a lot of effort to get this right, but it's worth it. And many of you I know have had really great experiences. Now, if those of you that are not sure whether you want to proceed with the surgery, this is my friend Alex, and I was with Sean and Alex and a few other of my folks and friends down in Sofia, Bulgaria a couple years ago. Alex has to be the tallest ophthalmologist in the world. <laughs> I'm about six foot, I'm six foot one. He's basically hitting his, door, hitting his head in the door frame, as you can see. Size nine gloves. And if Alex can basically do MIGS procedures, so can you. Now, here is a, here's a, here's a example of a classic approach, multiple stents placed within the canal, well-pigmented canal, strategically placing out. It, this is a procedure where actually a little bit of blood is good. Patency within the episcleral venous system is a good thing here. I'll tell you more about targeting shortly. But you can see here, basically, how we place these devices strategically. Look at the evidence of tripan blue flow within these major episcleral veins, aqueous veins, to exhibit on the table proof of patency here. And of course, the neoprene cache show us the diverse network of distal outflow channels and plexus, which are still need to be better studied in terms of how they mate with these canal procedures here to better improve efficacy. We know that aqueous outflow is segmental. We only know that we know part, only part of the canal is functional at any given time. And the key is basically the target. This requires us to go back in history a little bit. Go back on eBay and buy the book from Carl Escher, Aqueous Veins. I paid 500 bucks for it. I'm sure it wasn't worth that much in the 60s. But really, really valuable information, talking about the selective uh, identification of aqueous veins, these super highways that come off the canal, that are high, lower resistance, high flow channels that are particularly advantageous to target. One aqueous vein by Stepniak is shown can accommodate one microliter of aqueous per minute. If we hit, can hit two of these, we should at least theoretically be able to establish near epistolar venous pressure. So the goal is to find these, these, these collectors, which are not the same as the 20 other collectors around the canal. They're all different. It's like being in the middle of Manchester City, as I often say, your Chelsea football team, you've just beaten Manchester City. In Manchester, you want to get the hell out of Manchester. Where are you going to go to get out of the city? You're not going to take the back roads out to get out. You're going to take the super highways to get out to get as fast as you can from those crazy Man City fans. These are some, these are some nice pictures here, again, uh, showing from, from Asher's work. Um, and uh, showing again the presence of an aqueous vein, a clear vein coming off the back of the wall of the canal, meeting up with an episcleral vein showing laminar flow. Here's an example on the table. There you see an aqueous vein, which we don't see, it's clear actually. And here you see a recipient episcleral vein here, you can see the laminar flow here. The key is to target. Target where these veins enter the canal and target by looking at blood reflux. Focal blood reflux is likely a good sign for where these major highways are. So we look for this, and we target for them. Here's an example where basically we're looking on gonioscopic before putting the implant in, 
two, two implants here where you can see we basically have picked out two points where we see blood reflux. Focus on those points and that's the concept, at least early on, of, of targeting, targeting these micro stents. One, one is placed at the first blood reflux point and you see the second one placed here uh, at the second blood reflux point, you can see there are one inferior and, a, and, and superior to the horizontal midline. And once we basically uh, inject some BSS through the eye, we look for that passage of BSS. You see the blanching of that vein quite nicely here uh, to your left here, you can see. I'm just passing it out and outlining where it is right there. You'll see this aqueous vein filled with aqueous here as basically it enters into the wall. Now look at the blood reflux through the uh, stent from that aqueous vein filled with blood as we decompress the eye. And then when we re-inject again, we see the blanching, the significant blanching of those uh, aqueous and epispheral veins as well as the conjunctival veins. This is some good evidence, again, at least on the table, that we're able to establish patency and increase flow within those areas. Look, look at some of the uh, lymphatic channels present within the conjunctiva. These horizontal linear striations are basically macrocysts exhibiting flow within the lymphatics of the conjunctiva. These are all evidence on the table of proof or principle that we have flow. Another example here, pigmented. This is a single stent placed here. You see replacing it, uh, you'll see shortly replacing it strategically where we feel an aqueous vein is present. And you'll see the blanching after infusion of BSS in the eye that's quite evident of flow. We'll thank Ron Feldman, of course, for publishing his work on the episcleral venous wave of trabectum. But look how, the, look how the blood fills up when I lower the pressure and the blood enters the eye. Look at when we basically compress again or, or, or infuse in the eye. The infusion, that, that vein again comes up and it typically follows a linear pattern until a couple of meters back from the limbus, then it becomes more uh, parallel to the limbus and di dives into the canal in a figure of six or a serpiginous fashion. It's not easy to find these and we're pretty excited about some of the new technology that may help us. Again, the data here, this is some of the data we published on our double uh, multiple stents here showing pressures that can be dropped down to low teens with some medication use combined with the FACO. Randomized control trials, again, I don't have enough time to go through all the data here, but data is showing that we do seem to see some efficacy here compared to FACO alone, as well as improved outflow facility. This is, this is two stent data. We all, we, now, the Glaucos has currently two active IDE studies. This is the eye stent inject, which may be easier to use in terms of targeting. Two large uh, 500 patient studies combining FACO with eye stent versus FACO alone. There's also a supercoil device as well that's in study as well. Now, of course, many of you will say, that's great. That's great to see data with cataract patients. We see posters here on, 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 on uh, solo patients. This is a series uh, up in Toronto we looked at here of patients who had solo stents done, uh, phacic or pseudophacic. You can see pressure drops, you can see, down to about you know, 15 millimeters of mercury, six millimeter drop for these milder patients here. Now, they're still heavily medicated, no, granted. Uh, and of course, it's a heavily medicated group. But the point is, this shows you what the stents can do when you target and what we can achieve. So we're seeing, like I said, injectable stents that are kind of moving things forward here. How are other ways of moving things forward? Scaffolding, as opposed to simply bypassing the ability to scaffold the canal open with the hydrus device here, potentially allows for a larger area of flow within that aqueous distal outflow system here. And here's just a video just to show the, the procedure itself in a short clip here. We see the, uh, the, the cannula here used to incise the inner wall, enter the inner wall, and then pass the implant through the inner wall. It's a three clock hour implant, as you see here, five millimeters in length. And this allows these windows to basically be placed in areas where we can hopefully enhance flow by increasing the effective filtration area by stretching the wall and scaffolding the canal. And I want to commend a lot of these companies to look again at the basic science. Look at the excellent biocompatibility in non-human primates and rabbit eyes. Look at the different perfusion studies showing enhanced outflow facility with these procedures in uh, perfusion studies. And look at the cadaveric injury studies that we've published now to show that these devices don't seem to cause much disruption of the normal anatomy within the canal, which is important, of course, as well. The HYDRAS-2 trial, which, was present, which will be presented here uh, later today, randomized trial, a uh, number of uh, very highly credible glaucoma surgeons from Europe uh, combining FACO hydrus versus FACO alone, showing pressure reductions were very similar, but the real spread was on medication use. You can see at 24 months here, these patients, here, the difference here, 73% versus 38% off medications. And that's, again, the real outcome measure that we're looking at for these procedures in this patient population here. And you can see the difference here at the end point here, the main outcome measure here, 20% IOP drop after washing out of medications. 
You can see at two years here a difference of 34% between those that had FACO Hydrus versus FACO alone, showing again the additional benefit of having the MIGS device here. And it's great to see again more studies being done, over 1,000 patients in these randomized studies. Hydrus 4 studies the US IDE. You recognize some of the names here. And then we have comparative studies as well. So we will be seeing much more data coming out in the next few years to support or to not support the use of these devices. Switching gears to basically look into the supracoilar space, which is not limited, of course, by epithelial venous pressure. We know the potent pressure gradient that exists. We know the negative pressure gradient as we go farther back from the limbus. We know the driving forces, of course, from the higher side of colloidal difference between the supracoidal space and the anterior chamber. And this drives, of course, potential fluid flow. We also know cyclodiolysis clefts, not very successful, highly variable, hypotony to closure. So the idea, of course, is next generation stents trying to stent open the spaces, of course, with the right procedures here. Sidepass device here basically stents fluid through the stent into the supracoidal space. And the data here, early data clinical results showing these devices do lower pressure. These, these are combined patients uh, with FACO plus sidepass here, two different cohorts, showing both lower pressure and lowering medications. Again, number of trials, again, I want to share with you here. Uh, the USID trial has been completed here as far as enrollment, and we'll be seeing some data. Now, we've also seen that the space around the implant appears to correlate to success, as we published a couple of years ago. So that lake around the device seems to have some impact on pressure lowering. So we said, why don't we try to expand that space? What about a very known, well-known agent, viscoelastics? The idea, the concept here is to inject viscoelastic around the device. We typically use a super cohesive viscoelastic like Helon 5. There's the device on the guide wire, as you see, placing uh, the two little holes at the very end, which allows us to inject viscoelastic during the placement of this device. Fenestrations here you can see, and of course there's the uh, proximal and distal lumen. Here's an injection of 30 microliters. And here's another injection of a second bolus of 30 microliters. And you'll see why I'm, we're using 30 or 60 microliters here in a second here. But that's how much volume of the super cohesive agent we're leaving in the space around the device to ideally create a larger lake for potentially better pressure lowering. This is what we're hoping will basically address some of the patients we really need to get lower. As I challenge every single mix company to, to, to proceed here, you've almost got to taste hypotony to get that potency that we're looking for. That's the device placement there, and you can see postoperatively on day one, you can see the space is filled with some OVD as well as some hydrated OVD and, and, and aqueous. So a very nice potential large space. Maybe it's a little scary looking as well. RCT here, and I'll show you again. This, this is an RCT that we did ongoing, comparing side pass alone versus side pass plus 30 microliters and plus 60 microliters. These are solo patients, not combined with FACO, randomized looking at safety data and IOP data as well. Bottom line here, one year results, we see some dose response relationship here between the, the, the groups here. And this, again, this is preliminary analysis here between the 60 microliter group, the 30 microliter group, and the side pass alone. So fortunately, so far, we had not seen any site-threatening adverse events, uh, no persistent large choroidal effusions or detachments in this group here. And the responder analysis, we, we do so again, seem to show some dose-response relationship. Viscoelastic, viscoelastic expansion appears initially for the first year to provide a better success rate at lowering pressure. Also showing the size of the lake, also appears to have a beneficial effect here, you can see over a year's period here, by maintaining the space, even a year later which is correlated to IP lowering. Now, let's finish off talking about something we're very familiar with, creating blebs. This is a subcontinental microstent by Aquistus called the Zen implant, three different sizes, 45, 63, and 140 micron lumen. Um, I have a presentation later on talking about some of the early results, but this is, this is diverting aqueous into the subcontinental space using a fairly elegant uh, uh, implant based on Newtonian physics. The implant is very soft, highly flexible, and it's delivered in the ab internal method, as you see here, by placing a needle through the anterior chamber to deliver the device in a subcon space. Basically, this is like creating a bleb. And there you can see the implant. This is the 45 micron implant. It's about a 240 micron outer diameter, 45 inner, and 6 millimeter length. Flow studies at 2 microliters, 2.5 microliters per minute show our pressures are stabilized at about 7, 8 millimeters of mercury in free state. And you see the implant being placed through the anterior chamber through the angle, through the sclera, and emerges in the subcon space. And once we have the device in a satisfactory, the needle in a satisfactory position, we simply advance the slider forward in a one-handed technique, and you'll see the device emerge. And as the device emerges, you'll see it's a very faint yellow device, so it's hard to see. 
You'll see the device basically come out in the subconscious space. There it is, you can see. So basically we're diverting aqueous quite posteriorly. The idea, of course, is we all know the adva advantages of having a more posterior bleb uh, in terms of the uh, beneficial safety effects and hopefully long-term durability. And there's a device in the subconscious space. It's a very different procedure than a trabeculectomy in terms of how we create a bleb. The control, of course, is through the lumen of the device, which is critical, and there's the gonioscopic view into the angle there. And there's some post-operative pictures, typically low diffuse blebs. OCT pictures, again, will show as well the same image. Now, of course, we know blebs are still prone to fibrosis. We've gone to using mitomycin C, which is really taking this to the next level for patients who need it. And by injecting mitomycin C, a technique that many of you already use for needling, and many of you are starting to use more with trabeculectomy, we've had over 10 years of experience doing it for both, using it in this, in this procedure here, combining this device by injecting preoperatively, and then massaging the, the uh, mitomycin over to the area of the supranasal quadrant, which is where we place the device, temporal approach, allows us, of course, to get a chemical effect desired to control wound healing, which we all, of course, are very familiar with. And there basically is our technique, keeping, of course, the mitomycin into the area and keeping away from the limbus. If you're doing a trap, of course, that's important, particularly for that uh, foreign space incision there. And by doing that, you can see we're getting certainly, uh, you know, uh, a nice forming blebs, some little vascularity, um, but again, trying to achieve that diffuse bleb. Now, this is some data I'll show later today, basically showing pressure reductions here, almost 50% from pre-op. You can see that these eyes are certainly sicker eyes in the typical mixed population. 3.6 uh, medications here are being used pre-op, down to about, uh, if you see the one-year one year cutoff here, uh, at about 12.9, um, uh, 30 millimeters of mercury, 0.6. So we're approaching traps, and I call this the trap killer, potentially. We see clinical trials here that are underway, different pathways here compared to some of the other mixed procedures, both in the U.S. and Europe. So this device, you know, I kind of call it mix plus. And perhaps side pass with viscoelastic may also be in that category if the results pan out further with longer follow-up. These have more, more, more bounce to them, but they also have some more risk as well, of course. And so it's balancing out the risk and the eye appearing level in terms of where these devices will fit. Where they fit within a traditional approach of meds versus the more aggressive approaches. I think this is a really exciting time. And I really challenge our conventional way we treat glaucoma. And I think if we fast forward here, going to the future, I think we're gonna see us moving more toward the interventional side of things. In my practice, if somebody has pressure glaucoma, they're progressing at 14 or 15, they need a trap. I'm not debating that at all. I still can get single digits more effectively using a trap. But if there's a patient who has a cataract, who is high pressure glaucoma, is heavily medicated, and even if they're not well controlled, I will typically start with a cataract lens-based procedure, typically with stenting in the canal or supracortical space before going to the blebs. And even if my success rate is 60, 70 percent, I still have saved those patients from going to a more aggressive procedure. And I haven't hopefully violated the conjunctiva or affected or burned any bridges here. Saving the more aggressive procedures for perhaps a little bit later as needed. Augmenting, again, as need be. So I am very excited about where we're going with, with, with MIGS. Um, I think there's a lot of work that has to be done, and we should be held highly accountable by our colleagues and our patients. I think we owe it to our patients to do better than we are than using a 40 plus odd procedure. Again, no diss on people who, we all do traps. But I challenge the dogma, and, and glaucoma is not like refractive surgery, it's not like cataract surgery, it's not like you know, other types of surgery. These are very, very special patients here. And we're really proud to take care of our patients. But again, I challenge the dogma, I challenge the status quo. Status quo is not an option. I'm really proud to be able to collaborate with so many of you in the room here. This is not a single person speaking up here on MIGS and where we're at with MIGS 2.0. This is really a collaboration with everybody, colleagues, industry, scientists, and of course, we need funding. We need funding to get this stuff done. So MIGS 2.0 is here, I think. MIGS Plus gives us more efficacy, maybe for more, our, more of our patient population. Um, who knows what we'll be in five years? I really hope that somebody, and not me, will give a talk on MIGS 5.0 in a couple of years. Maybe it'll be called something else. Who knows? Thank you very much. I, that, that was a wonderful talk, and I do hope that we see more and more from you. So thank you so much. The thank AGS you. is really honored to have you among our ranks again. Thank so you very much. Very thank much. you, Cindy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.